Welcome to Emergency Insights. I'm your host, James Carter. Today, we're diving into a topic of immense importance, the recent updates to the Surviving Sepsis Campaign Guidelines. To help us navigate these critical changes, I'm honored to welcome Dr. Emily Zhang, a renowned expert in emergency and critical care medicine. Dr. Zhang, thank you for joining us. Thank you, James. It's a pleasure to be here. Sepsis remains a global challenge. The latest Surviving Sepsis Campaign Guideline update introduces some significant shifts, particularly regarding fluid resuscitation. What's the main takeaway for providers on this front? The key message is moving away from aggressive, large-volume fluid resuscitation. Historically, we focused on giving large amounts of crystalloids early on. The new guidelines advocate for a more cautious, individualized approach. We now understand that excessive fluid can be harmful, leading to edema and other complications. The recommendation is to start with a modest fluid challenge and carefully assess the patient's response using dynamic monitoring rather than a fixed volume protocol. And which types of fluids are now preferred? The guidelines now specifically recommend using balanced crystalloids, such as lactated ringers or plasmolite, over unbalanced solutions like normal saline. This is a crucial detail because normal saline can cause hyperchloremic acidosis, which we now know can be detrimental to patient outcomes. The move to balanced solutions is an effort to minimize these complications. Another significant change is the emphasis on earlier initiation of vasopressors. Could you elaborate on this shift and its rationale? Absolutely. This is one of the most important updates. The guidelines now encourage starting vasopressors like norepinephrine much earlier in patients who remain hypotensive despite that initial modest fluid resuscitation. The thinking here is that we can restore mean arterial pressure and organ perfusion more quickly without the risks associated with giving excessive fluid. It's about a balance approach, using both fluids and vasopressors in concert rather than relying on fluids alone until we've given several liters. So it's about a strategic combined approach to hemodynamic stabilization. Beyond fluids and vasopressors, the guidelines also reinforce the foundational principles of sepsis care. What are those non-negotiable pillars? The pillars of sepsis care remain unchanged and are just as critical as ever. The guidelines reaffirm that timely recognition of sepsis, rapid administration of appropriate antibiotics, and prompt source control, meaning interventions to eliminate the source of infection, are absolutely fundamental. These must be initiated alongside the hemodynamic management we've been discussing. Without these foundational steps, our fluid and vasal pressure strategies will not be as effective. This is a lot of information for busy clinicians to absorb. What are the key implications for practicing emergency medicine and critical care providers? The main implication is a call for adaptability and continuous education. These guidelines aren't just a protocol change. They signal a paradigm shift. Providers need to be comfortable with dynamic assessment, integrating advanced hemodynamic monitoring, and making more nuanced decisions at the bedside. It also requires greater multidisciplinary collaboration to ensure these updated practices are implemented seamlessly across the board. The goal is to move toward a more evidence-based, personalized approach to sepsis management to improve patient outcomes. Dr. Zhang, this has been incredibly insightful. Thank you for breaking down these crucial updates for our listeners. My pleasure, James. Thank you for having me.